What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are talking about whey protein. Is it worth it or is it just a waste of money? So the reason I'm doing this video is in the last few days alone, I've had several people, one of them being my mum, say to me, hey John, did you know whey protein doesn't do anything? It's a waste of time, you just pee it out. Uh, it's a waste of money. And I'm like, since when? when, when what makes you say this? Uh, and their responses have been, well, there was a BBC documentary and it basically said just that. And I had a good conversation with someone on Instagram and I said, hey, look, I, I can't see this is the case, but I need to look into it. Would you please send me the study that's linked into it? That person sent me the study. Uh, upon reading the study, I am pretty convinced that that is not the case and this is why. Now, before we go any further, I feel it's important for me to put my standpoint out there. I use whey protein. I use whey protein probably once a day at the moment for the simple reason of last year I made a conscious effort and decision to reduce the amount of meat that I eat. So eating protein or drinking whey protein allows me to hit my daily protein goals without having to rely on meat. I will always advise people to have real food before having supplements. However, whey protein does have a lot of benefits. Um, it tends to be low calorie, it's very bioavailable, uh, it has a high leucine content, which is something that we will talk about in later on in this video. So it does have many benefits, but sure, I would rather people got their protein from full meals, which maybe have more vitamins and minerals in it, and maybe less flavorings, for example. However, to suggest that whey protein isn't a food, to me, is a bit uh, misguided, because whey protein basically comes from the process of making cheese. So if you say that whey protein, you can't digest it, you can't use it, by that kind of thinking, does that then mean that milk and cheese are no good for you? For those of you who are new to the channel, I am not a scientist, I'm a nutrition coach, I'm a personal trainer, I am not going to argue with the science side of this study at all, but what I do want to bring into people's view is the methods and some of the, maybe the conclusion, I don't feel the conclusion that was taken for this BBC documentary is actually what this study is about or even saying. Okay, so let's get into this. I'm going to summarize some of these bits. So those of you who want to get a bit more in depth, want to get nerdy with it, in fact, I encourage you to do that. Get involved. Uh, you'll learn loads of stuff. I will put the link to this study in the description box. You can have a read over it. And hell, you might not agree with me and we can have a discussion in the comments. So the name of this study is Whey Protein Before and During Resistance Exercise Has No Effect on Muscle Mass and Strength in Untrained Young Adults. Now the first thing to note here is it's in untrained young adults. Really it's better to use trained individuals when doing studies on muscle mass and ergogenic aid, so basically supplements that aid performance. The reason for that is it's very hard to make fast and immediate short-term gains once you've been training for X amount of time. Your body's adjusted to that stimulus, it's used to the routine. When you have someone who's brand new, they're green, they've not trained before, you can pretty much get them to do anything and they will see some form of change. Whether that's a strength neural change, whether that's muscle mass, simply because it's a completely new stimulus for their body that they haven't experienced before. So in a lot of, um, let's say, other studies, I'm always going to say better studies, but that's probably not the right term to use, you will see that they will use trained individuals. The purpose of this study, to determine the effects of whey protein before and during resistance exercise on body composition and strength in young adults. So this is where I get into one of the issues with this study, and we will talk about this as we go further on. It's to find the effects of whey protein during and before resistance exercise. It's in a very acute bout. Well, the body takes a longer time to make those changes. So if you're only looking into that small a bout, you're not really gonna get much of an answer in terms of overall muscle gain or strength gain because we have to take into account many other things, our total protein turnover, our total calories for the day. There's much more at work here than just looking in the workout window. And they actually do look into diets and a dietary recall diet, and I personally feel that is probably the biggest flaw of this study, and it's something that we will explore shortly. So this study started initially with 29 individuals, 17 of them completed this study due to time constraints. So these individuals were kind of split in half. Half of them were given a protein shake to drink before and during exercise. The other half were given a placebo. The placebo was made from cornstarch, from maltodextrin and sucrose, so sugars. The protein shake was 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight. The average amount was 26 grams. That would tell us that the average weight of the person was 87 kilos, and that's very important as we will look at that later when we look at total daily protein intake for that amount of body weight. 
Each group would drink half of their shake mixed with water before the start of their session, and then they would drink equal incremental sips after each exercise. The exercise was set up as followed. It was six to 10 reps of three sets of nine whole body exercises. It was a double blind study, so individuals did not know whether they were taking the protein shake or whether they were taking the placebo. Before the study started, they used a DEXA scan. Now, if you don't follow our podcast, TLM Radio, recently we did a big podcast all about measuring body fat. Do we really need to do it? And what are the methods of doing them? One of the most reliable is a DEXA scan. A DEXA scan is basically a machine that you will lay in and it kind of uses very low frequency x-rays, for example, and it will tell you your fat-free mass, your fat mass, your bone density. So it's very reliable. They did this before the start of the study and at the end of the eight to 12 weeks. Again, I'm summarizing here, so by all means, check out the full text. The conclusion of this study was, the ingestion of whey protein immediately before the start of exercise and again after each training set has no effect on muscle mass strength in untrained young adults. Again, I'm not gonna argue with any of the statistics or any of the DEXA scans or, or really the results that were found. It's more the methods that I'm interested in. And one of them is the dietary recall. So they use a dietary recall diet, which is basically where you get people to write down what they've eaten in a day. Over the course of the eight to 12 weeks, they did collectively six whole days of a food diary. And week one, they did two weekdays and one weekend of food diary. In the last week, they did the same, two weekdays and one weekend of food diary. Now the problem with food diaries is that's obviously leaves a massive hole in the middle where people's food could go up and down, but also people tend to misreport. Like over a weekend, your calories can change so vastly, but then when you know someone's watching, you can really kind of be a bit more um, intelligent, let's say, about how you write your foods down. Now I don't know if these people were regiment enough to eat exactly the same amount of calories every day, but I find it hard to believe because as a coach working with most normal people, I find that it's very few and far between that people eat the same amount of calories every day, uh, unless maybe they're working for a bodybuilding show where things are extremely strict. And this dietary recall really brings up the big crux of this study for me. And that is over the eight to 12 weeks, both groups decreased the amount of calories that they were eating and also the amount of protein that they were having. Now, what we actually found from the results is both groups did actually build a bit of muscle, particularly in the knee extensors, which just goes to show that untrained individuals will often respond to things that trained individuals certainly would not. If they started, I don't know because it doesn't say, if they started at their maintenance calories, for example, they're now best part of 200 calories in a deficit for 12 weeks. And we know that when you're in a calorie deficit, the chance of building muscle are slim, particularly when protein has been decreased as well. In fact, when we go into a calorie deficit and we look to lose body fat, we increase our protein. The reason we increase our protein is that we want to try and preserve the hard earned muscle mass that we have built. And the idea of having more protein in there is that the body may choose to use that protein opposed to breaking down muscle mass. Because when you're in a calorie deficit, we know the body wants to, it needs energy. You're, you, you need more energy than you are taking in. So the body has to scavenge, the, basic, the body has to scavenge itself to find that fuel. That's why we use body fat. We, we take away from body fat to try and use it as energy. And we will also take away a small amount of muscle. So by keeping exercising and keeping our protein turnover up, or our protein intake up, I should say, that allows us to hopefully preserve muscle mass. Conversely, when you're trying to build muscle, protein doesn't have to be as high because you're in a calorie surplus. The body is not looking to scavenge for fuel sources because it hasn't got enough. It's got plenty. It's got adequate amount of fuel coming in. So it's not looking at muscle mass to go, oh, I need to nick some of you to keep me going throughout today. So when you actually look at their protein intake, when you start with the protein group, that week one, their calories were 2,274. By week 12, they were 2,091. So the best part of 200 calories less. Carbs dropped by 40 grams, fat actually increased, and protein dropped from 133.6 grams to 107.7 grams. And when you actually look at the placebo group, it's probably worse in terms of protein. They start at 2,000 calories, just shy, and they end up at 1,795. Again, roughly a 200-calorie deficit. Similar thing happens with carbs, drops by best part of 40 grams. Fat 
actually drops a small amount, but protein drops from 91 to 82 grams of protein. Now we know from all the studies that have been done on resistance trained individuals or athletes that we need to really be looking at a certain range for protein intake to get adequate muscle gain and to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And the reason I'm saying this is if someone's got a 2000 calorie allowance for the day, actually 1700, and they're eating 80 grams of protein for that day. We know that 26 grams of that protein has been taken up in their workout. So 80 minus 26, you guys do it, you're probably quicker than me for maths. They have that much protein to split between their meals throughout the day. And this is where we have to start looking at leucine content and maximally stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Now muscle protein synthesis is the process in which the body starts to uh, for want of the easiest way to explain it, lay down new muscle tissues. That's an extremely vague way of saying it, but it's that process of repair and rebuild. And if gaining muscle is our primary goal, then we want to maximally stimulate that as many times throughout the day as possible. And that might be roughly every four hours, for example. So if you need to get protein in every four hours and you need to hit roughly two to three grams of leucine. So leucine is amino acid that's very prevalent in whey protein and in meat as well. And what leucine does is it's one of the main drivers for muscle protein synthesis. So if we can have whey protein, which has a high leucine content, we can maximally stimulate, providing calories are high enough, muscle protein synthesis. So the point that I'm trying to make here is if your calories are very low, and your protein is low, and actually a good majority of your protein is taken throughout that workout, how can you maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis for each one of your meals throughout the day or even the week? Now I want to refer to the BTN Academy, which is a nutrition course that I've done, and we did a really in-depth bit on mTOR and muscle protein synthesis. And I'm gonna try and make this simple as possible. I'm gonna read this from my laptop, but I'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see it. There are three key things which feed into mTOR. And if you don't know what mTOR is, which I don't expect you to do, very simply, mTOR is the protein complex which activates muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so it's the precursor, it's the thing that happens before muscle protein synthesis. That's a very easy way to explain that. And if you don't remember what muscle protein synthesis is, it's that repair of laying down, let's say, new tissues, that repair and rebuild. It's a very vague way of saying it, but I think that's enough for this video. Um, there are three main things, there are three key things which feed into mTOR, namely leucine, insulin, a AMP kinase, or AMPK. Insulin has a very roundabout means of activating mTOR, using a convoluted pathway that ultimately means that insulin's effects are minimal at best. Leucine, however, stimulates mTOR directly and is therefore far more effective agent. So like I said, foods that are higher in leucine allow us to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. When building muscle is a goal, primary thing is we need enough calories. There's no two ways about that. We need to be at least at maintenance, if not in a calorie surplus, and we probably want to be regularly stimulating muscle protein to protein synthesis if muscle gain is our primary main goal. This leaves AMPK, which inhibits mTOR from activating muscle protein synthesis. AMPK is the energy sensor of the cell, which is expressed during periods of low energy availability. As muscle protein synthesis is energetically expensive and therefore a waste if your current energy levels are low. This is why during a dieting phase, muscle protein synthesis will be far lower. Muscles will be harder or almost impossible to build. And why, as you'll see later, muscle protein synthesis is a transient process. So in layman terms, what that's saying is AMPK is like the energy sensor. And if calories or our energy intake is not high enough, it's gonna go, well, I don't want to put all this effort into muscle protein synthesis because we don't really have, we don't have those calories. And it's an energy expensive thing to do. I, we don't have the calories freely ready to us to keep doing this and keep doing muscle protein synthesis. Hence, when you're in a calorie deficit, it becomes very hard to build muscle. So this is my point, that when you kind of take a study like this and if you take it out of context and you put it into a TV show and it's not really what the study's saying or it's not even logical, because often you will find, you'll look at studies and maybe the conclusion that they've come to isn't necessarily the conclusion that you think is logical. And it happens a lot, it can happen for many reasons. If you wanna go down the propaganda route, it can be because it's funded by a certain person. Let's say you've got a meat company and they want to fund some research to say that plants are bad for you. Like, I'm just pulling this out of the air here, and conversely. But it, it does happen, so it's important to read stuff and look for it from yourself. From that study, I don't believe 
in any way, shape or form, that says that whey protein is ineffective. For the simple reason of, they actually built a small amount of muscle anyway because they were untrained individuals, but also protein was low, very low, and total calorie intake was low. Like, their protein intake, if it was 80 grams for roughly, let's say, someone between 80 and 90 kilos, let's say, we know from studies that it's probably between 1.4 to 1 point grams per kilo is optimal for people that are exercising. And actually, in that study, it can go up as high as 2.2. But the kind of the way we're looking is 1.4 to 1.8. And they're probably a bit low on the low side of that, especially if they're in a calorie deficit as well. So I hope this video helps. I know it was a little bit more in depth than I often do. Uh, I did enjoy doing it. I was a little bit nervous doing it because I don't normally try and break down scientific studies and put myself open to, uh, to, to criticism on here. But I'm pretty confident and I feel very, um, from reading that a few times and talking to other people, that what I've said is, is pretty much on the button. Um, and I actually encourage you, upon filming this video, I spoke to one of my friends who has a podcast, Ben Kuma. And he recently did a podcast on this uh, and it was much more in depth about the actual BBC study and it cites a lot of the things about peeing out protein and all this stuff and where they feel that it's it's quite misconstrued. Uh, and I suggest you go and see that, especially if you watch that BBC documentary because I actually haven't seen it myself. I'm just looking at this study, but that specifically talks about the exact studies from that um, and all the other ones that I didn't cover today. So if you enjoyed this video, please give us a massive thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, hell, even hit that notification bell, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, guys.